Hello, welcome to another episode of the Project Purple Podcast. I'm Dino Varelli, founder and CEO of Project Purple. And today we are back in the podcast studio and I've got another special guest with us coming to us all the way from the University of Michigan, Dr. Sharaki, professor of internal medicine um, who specializes in pancreatic cancer. Welcome to the Project Purple Podcast, Dr. Sharaki. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. So I know we've been uh, we've been talking via email. I, 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 there's a lot of sayings, and you'll you'll hear this throughout this episode uh, that I'll say that I've said before. But uh, I always say something like full disclosure to our audience. But you know, I I, I I got introduced to you because I got a Google alert on a recent publication that was out in Nature Communications that uh, some work, some really fascinating work that you've been doing um, along with some of your colleagues throughout the country as well uh, that was out there. And um, I reached out to you and, and you were gracious enough to find some time here uh, to talk about that and talk about all the work you're doing in the pancreatic cancer space. So uh, it's awesome to have you here on the podcast. And before we get to that, data. And I know for our audience that'll be watching this, we're going to have a PowerPoint. We're going to throw up some slides. You're going to throw up some sl some slides and we're going to go over some information. But what is always customary on our podcast is just kind of an introduction for our guests listening and watching is really the background of our guests. And I always tell our guests, and I know I said this uh, offline before we hit record here, uh, this is your opportunity to kind of share your background, how you got involved in the pancreatic cancer space, uh, to give our guests a little bit of feel of, of what you've done and where you've been. And with that, um, I'm going to hand the microphone off to you to kind of share a little bit of your background with our audience. So I'm, I'm a medical oncologist, and uh, back when I did my training here at University of Michigan in medical oncology, um, and afterward, when where I stayed uh, for two years for as a faculty member before moving to MD Anderson, uh, where I worked there um, for 21 years, both as a physician taking care of gastrointestinal cancer and also as a researcher trying to find better answer for our patients. Uh, from the time I started working with pancreatic cancer, I felt the need to get better treatment and possibly way to prevent this disease because unfortunately this is a disease which has a very poor outcome. Our treatment as it was more than 22 years ago and still now um, failed to cure patients, especially when it's metastatic and uh, we are unable to remove it surgically. And, and for that reason, um, I have invested quite a bit of my career working in research, trying to find better answer in terms of developing a way to understand gastrointestinal cancer, including pancreatic cancer, and how we can develop better drug to treat it. If you look back to when you originally started your career, did you know that when you got into medical oncology that pancreatic cancer was going to be the field that you focused on? Or was there a patient or I kind of use the term like a tipping point at some point in that, you know, when you, when you began your career that you realized like, hey, this is really the place where I want to be. So, so uh, in, in, during my uh training, basically, I decided actually to be involved in gastrointestinal cancer, including uh, pancreatic, and also I do a lot of work in colorectal cancer, because I felt that the major need in this area where colon cancer is also the number uh, two um, cause of uh, cancer that's at that time in women and men combined um, and pancreatic cancer, in particular, uh, I, I took care of pancreatic cancer here at the University of Michigan. Uh, he, as a faculty after I finished my training, I felt their major need when you feel that people are struggling, especially when the average survival for metastatic disease was about six months. And now even with treatment, uh, we haven't made huge improvement. I felt that we need better answer than what we had done. And we still going in that direction. Uh, that's one of the things which attracted me to work in this field. 
So you just said something, and, and, and this will be my last question on this, but you know, given your experience, why do you think we haven't progressed as as far as maybe other cancers in the 20 years? You know, I, I think, you know, yeah, the 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 and I don't hate I don't like to paint like a doom and gloom picture. But I do feel the, so. The, the the survivability has risen, right? Slowly, not right. as fast right. as with, I think. And, with, with, with with having more intense chemotherapy, but correct. not by much. Correct. But so why why has the space been so slow to have like real progress? And and I'm not trying to point any fingers at anyone, but like, I guess in your experience being in the field 20 years plus, like, what do you, if maybe there's a couple things that we could point to of kind of barriers or challenges that the space as a whole is experienced, why we haven't been able to move the science that fast or faster than we should have. And and, and that we've seen in like other cancers. So, so in this field, uh, the barriers is the disease itself, the biology of the disease. In fact, a lot of effort has been put in into uh, trying to improve the outcome of this disease. But the barriers, as you might well know, first, it's a disease where because of the location of the pancreas being in the posterior part of the abdomen, it doesn't really give much of the symptoms. And a lot of people are diagnosed. Actually, the vast majority are diagnosed late in this stage of the disease because for comparison, like in colon cancer, you have colonoscopy and you can screen for it. In gastric cancer, although we don't do screening in this country, in country where they have high risk for gastric cancer, you can do upper endoscopies to find gastric cancer early, where as of now, I mean, the cure for most of these cancers is basically by finding them early and resecting them, uh, resecting them surgically. So by its location, and lack of symptoms, the vast majority will present in um, uh, late stages. And in fact, only 10 to 50 to 20% basically are, you know, diagnosed in early stages. So that's a major obstacle. Now, the biology also is a major challenge because uh, pancreatic cancer is unique in its biology, having things like extensive fibrosis, which being thought as a barrier to the delivery of treatment, um, being not responsive to immune therapy, where immune therapy now in other fields of cancer like melanoma, lung cancer, and others have made significant impact. Uh, unfortunately, uh, pancreatic cancer have been notoriously resistant to not only chemotherapy, to immunotherapy, and even other targeted therapy being tried over the course of decades now. So this disease in its biology, uh, typically resistant to our treatment. And that's why at one point uh, people feel this major challenge when trying new drugs on uh, pancreatic cancer. Yeah, you just said something there. It's like, it's like the holy grail almost of like, you know, finding, I use an analogy, like I remember watching, you know, movies, Indiana Jones about this holy grail, right? Which is the internal right. uh, salvation. And it's almost like, you know, again, I've been in this 12 years now. And when you you just said some things that really kind of hit me right now, like talking about immunotherapy and targeted therapy, which have really worked really well in, in, in some cancers. And it just seems like, like pancreatic cancer is just still so complex that these things just haven't worked and we don't understand why. And and I remember, and I mentioned the colleague before we, before we hit the record button, uh, when you were at MD Anderson, Anurban Mietra, I remember having a conversation with Anurban really long time ago, not long time ago, but probably about four or five years ago in Boston at a AACR meeting. And I remember he said, you know, and I watched his presentation. He had this pie chart and he's like, this is what we knew. And it had like 10 slices. This is what we knew about pancreatic cancer five years ago. And then the next slide was like, well, this is what we know 
about it now and it was like into like 30 slices, right? The more discoveries that way. And I'm probably not, not, that's probably really crude and rude as I try to explain his pr presentation, but the whole gist of the story is like, it, it is such a complex organ and there's still so much discovery to be discovered uh, with this organ and, and how this disease is. And it, it, it's, I, I guess from a, an, uh, an awareness factor or from an advocate standpoint, it's frustrating. I know there's so many people working in the space. Um, I don't know, maybe there's a way that we can try to accelerate things. And I, I, I have my own personal feelings and I'm sure you do too, as well as how we do that. And maybe we'll talk about there at the end, but um, it is it is truly complex and, and frustrating at the same time, because um, I know there's a lot of really, really smart people working on this, this problem. Um, but I just wish we, we had more progress in treatments and diagnostics and stuff, but, uh, I'm hopeful that we will get there eventually. I hope sooner than later, I guess. I, I hate, uh, I, I hate to tell you that I share with you my frustration about in fighting this disease. It's a very complex enemy and more skilled in resisting our drugs. But remember, every one of those diseases has its weak point. Mm -hmm. And melanoma at one point, and in not long time ago, uh, was thought to be basically resistant to chemo. We had no treatment, very short survival. And out of a sudden, you discover the weak point for melanoma. And now it, we have much better, better outcome with immune therapy. It's, it is frustrating that we know that the complexity of pancreatic cancer is much higher than what people expected a long time ago. But that's, I still view it in a way that shouldn't let us get into despair because at one point, like happened in other diseases, I think each one of those cancer will have its weak point. It just, I think a matter of time before we know what exactly the weak point where we can attack this disease. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's shift gears here and let's talk about your recent report in Nature Communications. Um, I know this involved a receptor called PPAR Delta. Right. Um, and I want to talk about that and the work you've done there and, and kind of these findings. Because uh, as we were talking before we hit record, I, I was super fascinated by it when I when I came across a Google alert and then kind of reading into it, I was like, oh my God, like this is from a layman standpoint and for someone who's super physical, who works out, who's active, it kind of brought me down that rabbit hole a little bit really quick. And I was like, oh my God. So with that, I want to get into it. So let's talk about it. Sure. Um, and and um, we could, if you wish, I don't know if it works in this format, share a slide to show you yeah, some absolutely. of this. It will yeah. be uh, somewhat technical, and please uh, stop me. And when it becomes too much technical, and you have a question, so I can make it more accessible to the audience. So what I'm going to do now, I will share my screen. So what I would like first to go back to the point where. Uh, to show that why this disease is more and more important to find an answer and find better treatment for it. Because unfortunately, what you can see in this um, graph from data reported by the uh, Sears, which uh, basically reflect what goes on in terms of this disease incidence and mortality in this country, you can see over the last approximately two decades, there have been steady rise of the incidence of this disease uh, where it rises by one or 1% every year. And unfortunately, the death rate from this disease continue to be steady. We haven't made a major impact. And unfortunately, within this year, uh, it's estimated about 62,000 uh, 210 people in this country will be diagnosed with this cancer, which represent about 3.2% of all um, cancer incidents. Um, 
about, unfortunately, close to 50,000 will die of this disease, and that will represent 8.2% um, of the mortality. So although the incidence is lower than other cancer, the mortality is higher. And one of the sign of improvement in this field, our ability to really find this disease earlier. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, most of patients unfortunately present with um, late stage disease where the survival was less than 5%. And our best approach at this point to basically offer patients a, 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 possibly a cure is to find it early and resect it. Um, and um, now with the development of genetic testing, about four, we've been found about 40 to 20% of individuals with pancreatic cancer, they have what we call it pathogenic germline variant, meaning there is a change in the uh, gene sequence, which point us to certain changes in certain genes that could predict an increased risk. Additionally, we recognize that about 10% of cases of pancreatic cancer happens in family clusters where you have these individuals who have um, higher risk because of having this uh, hereditary uh, type of cancer. And now it's been at least reported that in some series that with screening for this cancer to find it early in these individuals with high risk, we have higher probability of detecting this disease and resecting it, possibly offering patients better chance for a cure. So to go back what, to, uh, to PPAR delta. So PPAR delta is a, is a protein which resides in the nucleus and basically work as a receptor, as a sensor, which take the signal from what we eat or other uh, events would happen within our body and then act on it to change the transcription or the production of protein within the cell and in a sense, changing the machinery of the cells to respond to this signal. And PPAR delta does carry on important function in, in, in cells. To give you an example in the muscle, uh, PPAR delta, it can sense our need to produce energy like when we run or exercise uh, and to burn fat, uh, which the major source of energy stored in the body. As I mentioned in our discussion uh, before we started uh, this um, presentation, uh, when we chatted, that most of all we store fat and uh, uh, energy in the body in the form of fat. And with burning fat, every molecule, as you can see in this chart, produces 129 ATP, which is the energy currency unit in the body. In comparison, when you burn a molecule of sugar, you only produce 32 ATP using the same uh, unit. So burning fat is a more efficient way. And in, 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 in fact, in the muscle, uh, there are two types of fibers. Type one, the one which work by burning fat, and type two, the one, the one which, sim simply speaking, wor work by burning sugar. And people who exercise regularly and become adapted to tolerate uh, and endure exercises, they enrich their muscle with the type one. And therefore, people who can run a, a, a marathon can last longer than people who are not conditioned where their muscle have less of these fibers because they can burn fat unlike sugar, which we have very little storage of. And besides, as I showed, uh, fat burning produce more energy. Now, we uh, have- Can I jump in here for- so I, sure. I just want to jump in here. If you go back, to, so it's 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 interesting because we. And I just want to relate this to like the the type of muscle fibers and and where this comes in because 
I know for us, we do a lot of running, right? But we also do a lot of fitness and there's different, you know, runners tend to have more of the slow twitch uh, because it's more of an endurance game. And where the fast twitch comes in is where I know um, for a lot of our athletes that uh, that don't necessarily do a lot of long distance running, but are, are active and doing more sprinting and crossfitting and, and more lifting um, to that degree. But it's it's fascinating to me because like, and I know we're, we're getting to this and it, it, because I think these, these two types of people, I guess I could say from my my sense, my point of view, eat differently, and they they I think they use different types of nutrition uh, when they do that. So it's fascinating to see here, like the previous screen where you showed, like you know, fat is more of the 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 uh, the monetary supply in terms of the, supplying the energy to the muscle than sugar or uh, the other option that was there. So I just wanted to jump in here and mention that because I, I, that's really compelling to me, um, those last two slides that you had there. And, 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 and again, I, I guess it, it goes back to the point that people who exercise uh, tend to be able to utilize the fat and that's why you know they don't have a lot of the storage black uh, and versus people who less active, even burning fat become an issue because you need like an agent like here, PPAR Delta to activate this process and help you utilize the storage versus the storage being left and utilized. So yeah. uh, we have the capability now with the advancement of the research tool to really try to model in the mouse what will happen if we to change the function of genes by doing a, a model where we call them transgenic model where you can put a gene within the cell, enrich it with the gene and see what, how this gene function. And an experiment have, have been done like this one I'm showing here where if you to overexpress, meaning to make the cell make more of this PPAR delta, uh, you can enrich these, uh, it's called uh, here TG, which stand for transgenic mice with PPAR delta. They become enriched with this type one fibers and therefore they could tolerate um, a, a, a exercise much better than the wild type ones. This is uh, just by changing the expression of this gene that you could achieve this goal without basically training these mice. Um, and, and the other factor about this protein or gene, when it function, it requires binding to ligand, meaning there are substances bind to this gene to activate it. It's like, as I mentioned, it's a sensor. Until it gets a signal, it will not initiate the process, just simplistic speaking. And there are <coughs> substances which activate the gene, like the fat we eat certain type of fat like palmitic acid, linoleic acid, they do activate this gene so it can help when it sends to activate this process like burning fat. However, people also discover that you can make much more efficient ligands like the one here was developed by a pharmaceutical company and given this name GW501516 and being reported uh, I, in the literature that if you do supply mice with this sensor, you can actually enhance their muscle endurance, which made it very attractive. And in fact, pharmaceutical companies do, did spend quite a bit of resources uh, to make this synthetic compound to help the body uses better uh, energy from uh, the fat. Um, however, in, in using it in this approach um, and reporting on it, the public media became aware of this. And then you start seeing these reports in the public media saying <laughs> exercise in a, in a pill, meaning now we have a pill like in this report uh, by Rotors about um, you know, how you can use this synthetic ligands for PPAR Delta to enhance muscle endurance. And in, in Back, uh, this is in 2008, uh, after this report was published, you can see uh, even in 
uh, other uh, public uh, media outlet was the same um, you know, prediction. Maybe we're going to have ability to build our muscle endurance just by taking a pill, not X by exercise. However, the dark side of this activation, meaning if you to activate it indiscriminately, and like if you're an athlete and you activate it in your muscle, if you activate it in the whole body, because the pill, unfortunately, is not only going to activate events in the muscle, the dark side, what happens if we activate p delta in cancer cells? And in, 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 in pharmaceutical companies, they did find early on in their studies of um, the potential side effect of these drugs, uh, and from my understanding, they invested $10 billion in this direction, that unfortunately it can enhance cancer formation in mice. And, and, and there were studies like this study was published uh, in, from um, Dr. Bill Augustine lab in, at Hopkins. He's been actually a pioneer in, in, in reporting on this, uh, that you could see this, this gene called PPAR Delta if you to look for its, we call it expression or the, the level of uh, how much the cell contain of the gene it's higher in cancer samples of patients uh, compared to uh, the normal uh, part of the colon here, comparing colon cancer with the normal. And others did similar studies, like this study reported from Dr. Du Bois laboratory. Uh, and at that time, also they found both in animal model where you give them carcinogen to induce colon cancer or in patients, you can see that cancer cells have more p and in fact, to try to understand, is this important to cancer cells? Dr. Bert Wolgestein lab did make cancer cells of uh, colon origin in which genetically they deleted this gene. And then they tried to inject these cancer cells into the mice and see if they can grow tumor. And you could see the marked difference between the Hmm. cells which lost PPAR delta versus the one which maintain its normal levels. And you could see practically these mice fail to develop cancer. Now, people try to make more sophisticated mouse modeling. And one of the way to do it is to delete it throughout the um, organism, or in this case, the mouse. And uh, in doing this, there were studies which initially reported that there is some decrease in the um, formation of polyp in a mouse model where these mice are predisposed because of genetic mutation to develop colonic polyp. And they did see some decrease, but making these mice was very difficult because these mice, unfortunately, um, if you to delete the PPAR delta throughout the body, it does have um, an, a desired side effect um, where if uh, these mice were growing in the utero or embryonically growing, the placenta formation require this gene. And when you lose this gene in the placenta, you can have great difficulty making these mice. And in this experience, Experiment, you will, they only show you three mice, which they tried thousands of mice to make these uh, deletion, um, genetic deletion of these mice. So they couldn't have the statistical um, significant difference to call it. And at that time, it wasn't known. Now, um, subsequently, there was another study where they took the GW50156, Five, six, which I mentioned before, and took the same mouse model and they treated them with this compound. And you could see the marked increase of tumor size in the colon in, with this compound, which specifically target this gene. Now, what made this confusing at one phase, another group tried to make a mouse model where they decided instead of targeting PPAR delta in the region where we were losing mice in utero and you couldn't make mice, why not try a different region where you could 
have these mice survive and maybe not so crucial to the effect uh, uh, on this gene. And fortunately that resulted in producing the different effect with what seen in other model and in, in fact, deletion of PPAR delta in that case uh, made uh, the uh, cancer grow more instead less uh, mm -hmm. if you expected that promoting cancer. But it also, as it protected the placenta from losing function, people interpret these experiments to unfortunately not truly affect PPAR delta function. So nobody could really understand how, what the contribution of the study. And for this reason, one of, and this is part of the work we carried on to answer it in the colon cancer, um, we went on to specifically target PPAR delta in the colon and not in other organs so you can reduce mice to be run on experiment. And we gave these mice um, a compound, a carcinogen called azoxymethane, which if you give the my mouse, this compound, on average, a mouse will develop about five to six tumors. And what was really astonishing in that experiment that when I show you a picture here of what typically a mouse, you give them as oxymethane, they will develop five to six tumors as I'm showing here. However, if you to delete these, this gene, PPAR delta in the colon of this mice, only one out of 10 mice who received the same compound in the same experiment developed one tumor, which was like 98% prevention of development of colon cancer. At that time, we became very concerned about this and we published the paper in uh, Journal of the National Cancer Institute. Unfortunately, uh, that and others actually published in the same direction that PPAR delta is important to the development of cancers, and in that case, colon cancer, there was not much of attention paid to in the public media. And to make the matter worse, that while the big pharmaceutical company decided to stop their investment in, in making drug like the GW501516, this formulation became known and started being made by outlet which sold these drugs on the internet. And you could see here a website um, and it has a name Cardine, they gave it, and they sell it to individuals to enhance their muscle endurance. And unfortunately, as you can see on this website and you can even check some of this website now and see that it still has the same language which says in this example, but the drug gained pro uh, popularity in modern world among athletes for excellent contribution to muscle to enhance endurance things. Uh, and they, um, they, they described this drug as uh, a chemical that been developed uh, and it has no um, basically um, risk of side effects. Uh, and that unfortunately was misleading. And it was so much that misleading that a lot of individual use it to enhance muscle endurance, which prompted the World um, uh, Anti-Doping Agency for WADA to recommend screening for uh, the GW50156 uh, in athlete to make sure uh, because of their concern that this compound does have uh, <clears throat> a serious risk, uh, as you can see, uh, and, and, and says uh, that the development of the drug was withdrawn from research by a pharmaceutical company and terminated when serious toxicity were discovered in preclinical study. Again, going back uh, to 2017, which years after this <coughs> warning by Guara and others, there was another study which again, uh, brought up the idea that PPAR delta promote enhancement of muscle endurance. Uh, and soon after that was published, even uh, a public outlet like Nova was again um, promoting the idea although in, in that article that discovering exercise in a pill. Um, 
And again, unfortunately, um, this compound continued to be available to be used illicitly. So in, in our case, we really uh, concentrated on understanding this further. And, and, and again, in, in this example, we're showing like we did studies like in the colon cancer to show that this uh, gene is expressed more by cancer cells. And as you can see in cancer cells, not only in one compartment, you see it in the normal nucleus because it's cytoplasmic <clears throat> tell you how much these cells are addicted to having this gene uh, level higher. And, and we did studies showing that if we to increase the expression of this gene in the colon, how this can make azoxymethane and carcinogen develop more cancers, as you can see here, like every strip represented colon for mouse, and you can see the difference at different doses of azoxymethane, how the, in two type of uh, experiments, we show marked increase of the formation of this tumor, like we shifted the response to this carcinogen. And again, we showed even in the uh, experimental model where people debating whether this is with this uh, APC mutation in Haas or uh, 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 block cancer formation, we showed definitely increase the formation and even shorten the life of these mice when you overexpress the gene. And we did a lot of study to try to understand this. And actually there are other groups like this study from Harvard, which shows again as being censored to the lipid in the colon in enhanced colon cancer. Uh, now, we also showed that in colon cancer, when this gene increased in, in its level in the cells, it enhanced the ability of the cells to penetrate or uh, the basement membrane, we call it invasion, which is the first step in developing, me development of metastasis. And we did other studies to show in different cancers, including in melanoma here, showing that if you to block it, you decrease the risk of metastases. We showed um, the same thing also in gastric cancer by just increasing expression of this gene in the stomach, you, these mice will develop spontaneous invasive gastric cancer. And for us, we became interested in the, um, the pancreas because in about 2006, there was a study published from a, Ger a German group where they were looking through the gene in terms of what are the hubs or the critical nodes for pancreatic cancer to carry on its activity. And PPAR Delta came in and by a screen, actually, they weren't exactly looking for PPAR Delta as an imported protein to promote the function of uh, the, or to promote progression of pancreatic cancer. And here is showing some of their work was showing that PPAR Delta, as pancreatic cancer progressed through different stages, going to pancreatic cancer, we see more of PPAR Delta. And for people, uh, for pancreatic cancer, what goes on in the disease in terms of development, it goes on in stages from being a normal pancreas, we call them the acinal cells, to development of these pre-neoplastic lesion called panins or pancreatic interepithelial neoplasm. And these progress over time to become pancreatic cancer. Now, the concern people have that as we grow older and we develop mutation, unfortunately, because of exposure to a lot of things in the environment, a lot of us carry these pre-neoplastic lesions. To give you an example about maybe 50% of people over the age of 40 to 50 harbor these lesions. Now, luckily, most of these lesions will stay dormant and to not progress to pancreatic cancer, only a few percentage. However, the important thing we would want it to know why some do develop pancreatic cancer and others don't, because that's an important factor to know how to prevent this disease. And in animal model, it's been shown that if you to feed the animals, 
high fat diet, you can actually increase the risk of progression of panins to uh, pancreatic cancer. And given that high fat diet has the fatty acid, which work as a signal to PPAR delta, we were interested to know what happened in these perineoplastic lesion to um, PPAR delta expression. And what we found in studies we did in these panins that they do have increased expression of the PPAR delta. So it's sitting there and basically it can be activated with the diet or the drug, which I mentioned, to possibly promote pancreatic cancer. And that's what we tested actually in this model we tried to make. So both in uh, the humans, we can see that PPAR delta here shown in this brown color, increased in expression in dependence and later on in pancreatic cancer like it's been reported previously. What we also noticed that if you to take a mouse model, which very much it developed uh, pancreatic panins because they have a mutation in the keras in the pancreas, similar to what happened in human panins, which they have the same mutation, that they do have higher level of PPAR delta expression as shown here in the red color. Now, what we wanted to know is if we to alter the level of PPAR delta in these mice, by using genetic deletion, meaning we can go specifically cancer to the pancreatic cells and stop the production of PPAR delta. What happened to the uh, pancreatic cancer progression, meaning making these silent lesion, which a lot of people have and will die and not have pancreatic cancer, how high fat diet, as I mentioned to you, as you can see here, if you to feed these mice high fat diet versus the control diet, you can see the formation of these tumors as, as shown in this picture and here under the microscope, versus if we to take the same mice and just delete PPAR delta in these mice and give them the same high fat diet, now they don't develop pancreatic cancer. And, and, and for us, that was a really a good signal that this gene is critical to events like high fat diet, which is known as a risk for pancreatic cancer, to turn these uh, perineoplastic lesions to um, uh, pancreatic cancer. We also did the complementary experiment saying, what if we to increase the levels now also genetically in the same mice and give them whether high fat diet or that GW drug, which I mentioned to you. And with high fat diet, you could see in the mice where we increased the expression level or the level of PPAR delta in the pancreatic cells, we have uh, transgenic methods where we can specifically target the two pancreatic cells. And you could see the marked increase of the tumor in, in these mice. And, um, and, and, and in fact, uh, this is with high fat diet. And what was more alarming is when we use the GW, which is more specific and more uh, and act in much intense way in activating um, a PPAR delta. In these mice, in fact, when we take mice with this preneoplastic lesion, the development of pancreatic cancer it didn't take typically weeks, what we see with high fat diet. In fact, in, within nine days, we were seeing pancreatic cancer in these mice, which tells you how much activating this gene can be um, important to the promotion of pancreatic cancer from the panins. And, and, and indeed, within 30 days, all these mice with increased level of PPAR delta and where they were fed this GW uh, in the diet, they were all dead within 30 days. Well, in the same experiment, you can see the mice which didn't receive the GW um, and, and, and didn't have this increase because of the level which we did genetically, they went on to live a normal lifespan of 120 days and uh, as long as this experiment took and having even the same, the pre legion. So what we learned from this experiment that if you to activate this gene, which increases in level in this pre lesion, in fact, you could 
accelerate the progression of these panins to become pancreatic cancer. And to us, that opened the door for A, thinking about people who might have these preneoplastic lesions, whether because of age or hereditary predisposition or et cetera, whether we, they should be consuming high fight diet. They should be exposed to drug like GW. Um, now, the other side of um, the coin is that there are drugs which inhibit PFAR delta, which one can develop and possibly stop this process from turning into pancreatic cancer, and we're working in that direction. Um, so I think for us, uh, we were very um, surprised how profound the effect of PFAR delta in, in this instance. So I will stop here. I know said a lot of technical things. And <laughs> if you have a question, I'll be happy to answer that. Well, I, I, I had a couple, I, I've been taking notes and I, I wanted to jump in, but we were on a roll and, and your slides were awesome because you, you told the story perfectly where this started and, and where it relates to pancreatic cancer. So thank you for doing that so eloquently. So, and, and I want to try to like use an analogy here. If we think about PPAR Delta is this antagonist that we see in early onset and then that we see in late onset at a, at a pretty big amount. So if, and I've heard this analogy before, if um, let's say PPAR Delta is the Uber that's delivering the food to the cancer to allow it to grow and to get bigger and to get stronger. If we take the Uber out, then the cancer doesn't have the ability to grow and get stronger and metastasize. I know that's really crude and rude, but I guess I'm trying to use an analogy. In, in, in a simplistic way, you are correct. Um, I mean, the, the, what's happening here, PPAR Delta provide cancer cells with a lot of more resources. One of mm -hmm. them, it provides the cancer cells with the energy. As right. I told you, it can give them more energy. Uh, the other thing which we have in the paper and they didn't get involved in, what it does, how did it speed up cancer, pancreatic cancer so fast? It was, as we published in the paper and it didn't um, go into the detail, it changed the immune microenvironment. Um, a lot of us, at least thinking again about this, why do we develop cancer? Why do we, go from having all these pre-neoplastic, pre-cancerous lesion, which the body can control and stop it from becoming a cancer. And then out of sudden they become frank cancer and, 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 and we see it. A lot of what goes on is the ability of the immune system to control and eliminate cancer. Cells. And what we were surprised in these mouse models that by activating PFAR Delta, we get like within three days, an influx of certain cells. Not all immune cells are healthy. There are cells, we call them immune suppressive cells. Um, these cells suppress the other immune cells from attacking the tumor cells. And the influx of these suppressive immune cells um, especially in our case, seeing cells, we call them tumor-associated macrophages, and there are myeloid-deprived suppressive cells. There was a huge influx. Actually, I can show you in this picture, uh, um, and I guess we, uh, we stopped sharing, but I, I can go to the last picture we, we left at, and you could see the difference between the picture here shows the mice which had the genetic mutation and pre neuroplastic lesion, and we call them here KC, and mm -hmm. at three and nine days uh, on a diet, uh, which basically um, it, 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 without the GW diet, and even with it, uh, without the PPAR Delta, not, nothing much going on. But with the PPAR Delta and the GW diet to activate it, 
within three days, you could see this influx of all these cells and even the fibrotic cells and the immune suppressive cells quickly. And this is like protecting these cancer cells if they decide to progress. And then within the span of nine days, it's like created this perfect environment for them to grow and become cancer cells. And, and, and for that reason, uh, like you said, it's an agent which facilitating the development of cancer cells uh, and the progression of pancreatic cancer. So fascinating. So I, I've got a couple questions left here, but two that popped up, and I'll, and I'll ask your opinion on this. I heard diet. We heard diet quite a bit. We know that diet does uh, obesity, at least people with with certain diets, people with certain body weights that that impacts. And I'm talking about pancreatic cancer as a whole, right? So here's the question. Because, and, and, and I want to say something like we can't, P par delta is in us, right? Like you can't eliminate PPAR delta because it does have a significance in muscles and activity and stuff. So I guess there's probably people listening going, well, let's just take out PPAR delta, right? Like that's a, I think layman, you know, people sometimes will say, like, we hear this all the time. Well, why do you need your pancreas? Just take it out. You know, if you're high risk, just take it out. Right. Like, and that, that there's all sorts of issues that happen. So, so the solution isn't to eliminate PPAR delta then, or here's my question is the solution and this is at a, at a very high level do you think there needs to be a change in what we eat in terms of diet or is there do we need to find a solution to change this p par delta so so we need to do both so one in terms of the diet the statistics basically and there are studies shows that higher body mass index or BMI, mm -hmm. high fat diet and obesity promote pancreatic cancer. Uh, even there are human studies besides the animal studies. Correct. So we need to re really opt for healthier diet with less fat, especially the one which like palmitic acid is activated, mm -hmm. off, at least. Um, so more balanced diet is very important. Exercise is also important because, again, with providing the ligand to activate this, because these lesions, like the tannins, they are sitting in the pancreas, and people walk around, and yeah. luckily, very few of them develop into cancer. Uh, but they is like you have these target waiting to sense the ligand and then mm -hmm. start doing different things. So for now, I think having a healthy body mass index, a uh, healthy diet is very important. Exercises are very important. That's one thing we can work on now. The other thing which I want to emphasize, especially for young people who are using these compounds like cardine or GW. Correct. Please, this is not only the mouse model in the pancreas. I showed the data with the gastric cancer and we have data with, with the colon cancer, please do not use this. Because unfortunately, uh, this, these effects, they might not see in, in a short span of time, but predicting what happened in the mouse, this is, could happen decades later where it could increase their risk of developing cancer. So, so that's important. Now, the other thing is, like you said, we cannot believe we popped up on ourselves. That is true. But what opened up for us the opportunity to develop new drugs, they are PPAR delta antagonists. And meaning cancer cells have higher level of PPAR delta than normal cells. And what we're working on is trying to use these antagonists to block this hyperactivation, if you will, to tune it down to normal range to really kind of suppress the ability of cancer cells to, in a sense, overutilize this protein to promote. So, so there are work and, and, and people targeting PPAR delta um, to develop specific drugs, which will affect the cancer cells preferentially versus the normal cells, because as I've shown earlier, 
cancer cells have much more higher level than uh, what in, in normal cells. And that's open the therapeutic targeting opportunity. Here. So that's where I was just going to ask. So, I mean, I, I, we know the challenge with the current treatments is that there's nothing really that can get into the cancer cells. So in theory, then using prepar delta as the delivery for targeted therapies potentially is something that's being worked on. Is that what you're saying then? That, that's some of the research effort um, I'm, and I, I think other people are working on because the advantage of this, think of it this way, that a lot of these compounds do get like the prepar deltas trying to use the legends, which mm -hmm. typically, especially if they're built on a lipid uh, platform, because lipids really penetrate quite a bit of barriers and get to the cells. Uh, some, some of these target, a small molecule can get to the um, PIPA delta. And now instead of binding to something which will activate it, we will be, have the opportunity to inactivate this gene and at least reduce its activation level to where it cannot be utilized by cancer cells to promote their growth and suppressing the immune cells from attacking them. That's one of our goals now. It's awesome. I love it. I love hearing about it. So I got three questions left. And my first one is, so with this data that you guys have analyzed and all this, this, this paper that came out, where do you go from now? I'm sure someone uh, listening, watching is thinking, okay, so, so what, what I have I'm, a loved one. How do I get in? How do I get into the clinical trial? Right? So, so what's so, the next steps so, here? We're trying to develop newer drugs. We are asking the national cancer Institute for funding. Uh, we've been approaching other funding agencies to develop newer drugs. Um, there is, uh, initiative I'm trying to work on here at the University of Michigan to develop this further. Uh, as of now, um, unfortunately, uh, we will need more time to develop these drugs in the um, testing, preclinical testing to become available to patients. So unfortunately, we don't have the drugs available and we need to test this in the animal model to make sure it works as we hope for uh, before we get it to clinical trial. Um, but for now, again, uh, like I said, there are, and also we approaching the aspect of prevention in terms of diet and exercise, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, unfortunately, it's not available for clinical trials as, as of now. And I'm hoping with the NIH funding, we've been uh, repeatedly going through cycles and cycles for funding, um, and I hope they'll give us the chance. I hope so too, which leads me into this next question. And I go back to your experience, the time you spent in this. We just, you, we, you just mentioned, you know, going to NIH, trying to get further funding, the process, you know, cancer uh, or going from, you know, uh, mouse models now so, going so, to so, drug so, development. So, so to give you an example, one of the things like we've been submitting this grant for further work as we've been doing this. And we've been trying to kind of find little fundings here and there to carry all this work. And mm -hmm. you go through cycles where people say, well, the data is so impressive. Why don't you publish it? And, and, <laughs> and, and, and when we respond to them, yes, we're going to publish it, but we want to go further. So we're waiting for this and we're hopeful. Uh, but um, there are resources which we're trying to get more of it to invest in this direction. So where does this space, and this is my question, and we may have answered some of it here, but where do you think the space can do better to get better outcomes? I, I think um, several things I learned from this experience. Uh, one of them, actually, we need to, be, to have more public awareness. Uh, to give you an example from the presentation I've made, there are prominent scientists, including people in the field like uh, Dr. Bert Wolgestein, uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 Raymond Du Bois, and others, which we've been publishing data to say that activation in PPAR Delta and PPAR Delta promote cancer and metastases. And through 
at least I would say now close to two decades of my work and work of others, none of this receive attention in the public media versus the opposite story, which says, uh, you know, you have an exercise pill now. Mm-hmm. Repeatedly, they receive. So I would like to have a more balanced presentation of the scientific data. And thank you for being allowing us to really share this with the public to say the story has two sides. And what we're concerned about, like I mentioned before, the fact that we have young people who are using drugs on the black market to, to use this. So I think more balanced presentation in the public media and especially uh, group, uh, they're interested in advancing um, the work, uh, research work in this field will be very helpful to us. And that's also will help us to not only tell the public about our results, try to pr- develop preventive measures until we develop better drugs to prevent pancreatic cancer. Because now, as I told you, now we're getting signals that we can detect this earlier in people at higher risk. Unfortunately, all what we have now is surgery. Can we do better if we change the diet, exercise, develop new, new drugs, which will prevent uh, surgery? All of these are important goals, and we hope that we'll get some investment from the NIH or other funding agencies. I hope we, I hope we get there. I, I, I think we, if we continue to push, continue to share these stories, uh, continue to raise awareness amongst not only the medical community, but the general public, I I think there's going to be an outpouring of people saying, hey, we need to do this. And when there's that type of pressure, um, I usually don't go political, but we're going to get political here. I think politicians listen, right? And and further funding happens. I mean, that's just the way it works. Uh, But I think we've got to get to that point, right? We've got to get the awareness and we've got to get stories like this out there that this thing, you know, this is, this is a a major development. Now we've got to take it to that next level, but we need money to do that. Um, And and the other thing with this awareness also, we're not only pushing for more funding, we educating the public about- correct what could certain gene do and what could some of the misadvertised compound which being sold could do yeah. to make an no awareness harms. that you know we could be increasing the risk of cancer by doing certain interventions absolutely absolutely uh, it's great stuff uh and, and this was awesome my last question here and then we're going to share um if our audience wants to connect with you where the best place would be but this is a uh, I, I always save this for the last question for all our guests and and given your experience what you've done in your lifetime here there's no right or wrong to this answer but how do you define pancreatic cancer what's your definition of it it's a very formidable foe um i still recall the patient i lost to pancreatic cancer um but the best way to defeat your foe is to know the most important, the most information you can collect to know their weak point and use it. Awesome. If our audience wants to learn more about your research, maybe there's another group listening, they want to maybe fund your research, where's the best place for people to connect with you? So, so uh, I, I think we, we do have, and after the publication, um, the Rogel Cancer Center, where I'm currently work, working at, at the University of Michigan, did have a, um, uh, a site where presented the data. So that's one site they can go to. But for me to connect if they have question or can be of help is going to be a, my email, which is I Shuraki I S H U R E I Q at umich dot edu, which uh, I think you, the email you have, if you can share with yeah. the audience. Absolutely. And, and I'll say this, uh, we didn't know each other. I didn't know how to get a hold. I mean, I knew some people in Michigan, but I was like, oh, let me see if I go out to Google. And I found your email off of the website there. Uh, you know, it's not that hard to find. So if you Google you and you get to that University of Michigan uh, page that you have there for your lab, you can get in contact with you. Dr. Sharaki, thank you 
for all you're doing in the pancreatic cancer space. I love interviewing doctors, scientists, clinicians, people in the space that are on the front lines because it gets us so excited to share what you guys are doing because we need more of this. And and hopefully, you know, maybe there's a there's a there's a kid in medical school that's listening to this. Uh, I, I shouldn't say kid, but a student that's in medical school, medical school, listening to this, that gets inspired by the work you're doing to get into the pancreatic cancer field. And hopefully the patients listening know that there are so many people working really, really hard to crack this thing. Um, and that's what we need. We need, we need an A team and you're part of that A team. So thank you for all you do. And thank you for being a guest on our podcast. Well, thank you very much for giving them the chance to share the information. It is a worthy cause and hopefully one day we'll make a difference. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Project Purple Podcast. If you like what you hear today, feel free to share this episode and please follow us wherever you listen to podcasts. Till next time, please be safe. That's a wrap of another episode of the Project Purple Podcast. Mm-hmm.